All right, everyone, welcome. Um, so this morning, we're going to talk, uh, start with our keynote speaker, Dr. Siglinde Snap, Director of the Sustainable Agri-Food Systems Program at CIMIT. And Dr. Snap will be introduced by Jesus Herrera de la Cruz, Dr. Jesus Herrera de la Cruz, who is the Deputy Director of Knowledge Management and Inter Information Technology at CIMIT. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome again to today's uh, sessions. Uh, good evening or good night to all our colleagues following the event online. It's a pleasure for me to introduce you, Dr. Sitlin Snap. She's our uh, keynote speaker uh, for today's session and um, well, as you can see on the screen, uh, she has a vast experience uh, before joining CIMIT. She's now the director of the largest research program at CIMIT. If I'm not uh, wrong, uh, she's leading more than 400 people, isn't it, Dr. Snap? Four, oh, 600 plus, they're correcting me. <laughs> so congratulations on uh, those uh, great achievements. Uh, the expectations are high, of course, but uh, I think you are going to satisfy us with your speech today. So uh, I'm, I don't want to be more time in here because we have more important people to use our microphones. So please uh, welcome Dr. Siglin the Snap. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. So I didn't recognize myself there because I actually go by SIG. All this Siglinda makes me feel like I'm back in the day, which is fine. In Africa, they can say Siglinda. In Mexico, I do love being in the global south. In America, not so much. <laughs> so in order to be, when I was a professor at Michigan State, in order for to be approachable, I went by SIG. So uh, if you don't mind terribly, uh, <laughs> love to have you in 100% here. I hope that this is going to seriously change your life. So if you don't mind closing your computers, your phones, just for 30 minutes together, please do so. Thank you for, forgive me for that. So, yeah. So I am very honored to have this opportunity to talk with all of you about inclusivity because it really, is something we need to think about, not just because it's a check. Yes, we did gender, fantastic, good for you. No, it's because our science, our knowledge needs to consider our history, who is a science for, whose voice counts. Sorry, I can never stand behind those things for obvious reasons. So. And because I like to pick on people in the front row, Janet. <laughs> so when you take a look at this, this isn't how we normally see the world, right? And yet it's true, right? And notice how many countries in the global south have more than 100 bird species named after European people. So there's a lot of interest right now in making some changes. And I think it's high time. And I am grateful to be alive today. A lot of the things I thought when I first came to Africa, it was nice to see trial designs up there, but what I'm known for is inclusivity. How do we make trial designs that make it easy for agronomists to make sure that farmers have a voice? It's not any kind of trial design. It's a particularly a type that's inclusive. And in the past that was critiqued, it's not science. She's doing extension as if that were a bad thing. But anyways, that, oh, she's just an agronomist. Okay, fine. But actually, if we wanna make change in the world, I think, and I'm going to make a case today, we have to think about stakeholders. And it's all about data, right? That we share with data and whose data counts. So there's the exciting thing about being alive today is that this is not a fringe movement anymore. This is mainstream. So I'm not just someone with a big chip on our short shoulders, right? I'm someone that actually has a voice that counts. And I'm super excited and appreciate that. Places like uh, Plus One have authorship policies that are explicitly about a more inclusive standard. I can actually point out recently in a paper review I did for Nature that the fact that they had no one from the Global South and yet they were talking about 
irrigation systems in West Africa and using data from many papers and from government, uh, uh, different government organizations, all from the Global South, and yet there was no one them to help interpret them from the Global South. And by the way, that paper was accepted. <laughs> I was furious, <laughs> but they did add some authors at the last minute. So anyways, we have the San Francisco, obviously the big declaration on research assessment and the fact that research quality in DORA, research quality is now seen to have to include the stakeholders' uh, voices is really exciting and, and fair ways of, of working is exciting. So I won't uh, point you to all these different articles coming out, particularly Nature has led the way um, in terms of pointing out that we need more people in our discipline. I mean, it's great to see the diversity here today. We need more diverse people represented. We need, it. We need to remember when we cite people, not just your own networks. You know, the good old girls network, I do sometimes perhaps cite too many women, but there's fewer of women. So 50% <laughs> of papers recently shown to not um, half a percentage, um, half of it being cited if it uh, happens to be led by a woman in elite medical journals. So these are the kind of things that are now being, data is pulling out the fact that we need to get do better. So being inclusive, I would say, is more than an aspiration. It is a necessity for our survival. And the reason I say this is because the grant, it's not just that we need everyone to be part of uh, you know, development. Sure, of course, there's equity issues. But more importantly, or as importantly, there is the big challenges of our day, the wicked problems, the recalcitrant problems. I would let you, I, from in my view, we actually can't address them with conventional science. Reduction of science has done amazing things, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but it has not necessarily addressed these big challenges of the slow ones, like, soil degradation, water degradation, the extreme events of disease pandemics, of uh, floods. Many, the solutions require often value conflicts. If you're gonna improve soil health, you also have to produce enough food, right? So if you're going to do the technologies that really support uh, improved nutrition, sometimes those aren't that maximum calorie producing. So we need to have data sets, long-term data sets, because you can't see slow processes like soil carbon change unless you have long-term experiments, unless you have monitoring over time, right, and space. You can't pick up uncertain events like invasion of new ladybird beagles in Michigan unless, again, we have these sentinel sites, these long-term experiments. So it all comes back to what? Data, right? So. The three themes I want to talk about today are decolonizing your mind, decolonizing access, and decolonizing expertise. So to start with decolonizing your mind, if you have worked in the Global South, you will notice every agriculture research station you go to, they, those buildings are built with the same, uh, <laughs> some people are laughing over here, they have the exact same uh, architecture. <laughs> And luckily it's a pretty good one for the tropics, but you see the same bricks, uh, the same approach, because there was that one little island that colonized many of us, including the US at one point. So these research stations and the types of randomized control trials, this is, we received this from our colonial um, leaders at that time. So one of the challenges here, the other issue is agriculture research stations. Have you ever tried to close one down? You can't because they're politically motivated, right? And so at in Michigan State, we had one that was basically the muck one. So this is a organic soils for cereal production. This is only like 0.001% of our production was cereal, but we could not close that thing down. It was super expensive to keep it going because that is a point of pride for the local uh, uh, governance entities. So they're not, you can't, you, these are situated in certain places and they don't necessarily represent the cropping systems or the soils or the local context because they were originally set up to based on political wills, right? So inference space, all of you as data scientists know how challenging that is, that our, especially in agriculture, 
And even we're now finding out in health, right, that we there's a certain group of college students that tend to be studied over and over again, but our inference base to the rest of the world is, is challenging. Same in agriculture. We have a problem. Soil organic matter, early on in my career, I published on this, is three times higher in research stations, in the 10 major research stations in Malawi, in Southern Africa, than is actually typical on farm. So how, what works on a research station? How is that inference to on farm? How do we generate relevant knowledge, particularly in the complexity, the uncertainty that is out there? Well, one thing is open data, right? And I am very ex excited about efforts to decolonize access, which I've heard about here at this meeting. Because I used to have a similar uh, evolutionary tree outside my door showing that open data is how evolution continues. If you keep your data private, and by the way, even though I'm an advocate of open data, there are data sets which have never seen the light of day. And why? Because when I looked at them closely, Maybe over a beer last night, I was saying, oh, I have this amazing data set from Malawi. You should see it. I want to share it. Let's publish together. And then I look at it, and, and it has huge holes in it. <laughs> it's embarrassing, right? Because I forgot there was an El Nino event, and we didn't. But the world needs those incomplete, and it needs ones where there, where there was failures, right? We have this problem of positive bias in agronomy. We only publish things that are positive, and we often leave out the data sets that are imperfect. So moving beyond private data, where you see extinction events, to an evolutionary uh, approach, I think, is, is really a fundamental shift happening, and I'm, I'm super excited about it. And also the fair. I mean, we can't have access unless it's fair access. I think you all know the findable, accessible, interoperational, operable, and reusable. But I, there's also efforts um, in South Africa and also in a group in Europe where they're trying to say, make sure that fair data. Sorry? Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, is transparent, accountable, and it allows for replication. This is one of our big issues today. I don't know about you, but I'm fascinated with these uh, podcasts about, you know, there's some things, particularly in behavioral sciences, people that study lying have been caught out lying in their own research. <laughs> it's really astounding. We need to be able to reproduce things, folks. Um, obviously, we need to follow the ethical and legal frameworks. There is very good work in this space that FAIR also means equity and that it, it will support better science. Again, inclusivity is about rigorous science. It is about better science. So decolonizing expertise. This is where I think we need to build on action research on a whole new approach where diverse types of knowledge and expertise actually count. Respecting indigenous knowledge. Nice to say, not easy to do. Again, I've used different trial designs to try and make this more possible to make sure that we don't just ask farmers, do you like this? And they tend to say, what? Yes, come back again. We'll have a feast and we'll have some fertilizer access here. No, what did you not like about it? What are you doing yourself already? How do we document innovations going on and, and co-create with communities? This is not easy and I'm looking to all of you to help us. How do we do that? How do we document in Dataverse and in these different repositories and how do we then do synthesis that includes different voices? This is not easy. and is the, one of the bigger challenges today. So this is one of the, I hope you take this one slide as a takeaway today. Because as Sundar Vaiti, uh, retired uh, professor at Michigan State University put it, you know, we got to the moon in the 60s using conventional science, engineering. It's amazing. We have improved varieties, higher genetic gains, but have we realized soil health? Have we realized food nutrition around the world? People go to bed hungry. So we're not, it is not enough. And that's partly because when there's low uncertainty and low value conflict, we were all aligned to get to the moon. There wasn't a value conflict there. The uncertainty, as long as you get your math right, you can get to the moon. So that worked. But as you get into higher value conflict, as I said, soil health, Technologies don't always maximize food security in the short run. Maybe in the long run, yes, they're important. But sometimes when, when we use our small pieces of land and maximize soil health, you actually don't maximize calories, which is why people maximize calories by using more intensive and not sustainable intensivity. So there is value conflicts at the core of being able to produce food while staying within planetary boundaries. 
So uncertainty is high. I think I, you know all the sources of uncertainty that keep uh, growing every day from conflict to climate change. So there is a whole group that is working towards action science to uh, address these extreme and uncertain events, to ad address the slow pushes, such as uh, soil health loss and value conflicts. Um, you can see it in areas like in Malawi where there's been a big push around irrigation. Well, it turns out, yes, you can build the infrastructure for irrigation, again, using conventional science. Is it there today? This was from 10 years ago? No, because it's all about governance. It's all about local adaptations and equity issues, who has access to that higher quality land. And so irrigation is definitely a wicked problem. So what is action science? Probably many in the room know this, but often it's talked about as in terms of you plan together, you co-identify challenges, data comes in there. We gotta make sure that the, challenge, the opportunities and challenges are data-based or evidence-based. Act and observe with communities, again, whose observation counts? Is it mine as a crop scientist saying this is a better variety? Or is it yours who actually will have to use that variety within your own farm? Wh whose observations? Can we, can we actually monitor both your preferences as a local community stakeholder and the scientists? Can then we iteratively reflect and refine together? Because we need to synthesize. We are researchers. We're not just working in every village as an anthropologist. We are trying to produce better bets. We're trying to refine and get options that then can be scaled out. So how do we do that? Again, data is very key in this. The only other point I really want to point out here is time sensitivity. Scaling over time and space is one of the big challenges in agriculture. There is certain biological realities of reproductive cycles that mean that timely management, which is very tricky, how we monitor, how we record this, is another one of your challenges in your data archiving, is that as you try to be more applicable to the health sphere or to the agricultural sphere, having to deal with uh, data that really matters where you are in the world and at what time of the year, these are things we have to deal with. So learning labs have been proposed. These are sometimes called living labs or learning landscapes. But this idea that we can get stakeholders at the table to assess the data with us, to make change, and to suggest options is, is very exciting. And I'm going to talk about a couple examples to show you that this is not just about local adaptation, although it is that, and about development, sustainable development. The first example is more of a sustainable development, which is very important. And this, this, this action science can help this. Here in Mexico, this Mas Agro team has done many different sustainable development options with public, private, and civil society together. But here's one example that I thought any people can relate to, and this is sustainable sourcing of barley. So for what? For beer. So going from field to glass, you have to get everything right to what is actually sustained. You have to monitor that. What is actually sustainable about that production? And what is actually uh, then monitorized to help farmers to, take, uh, to be able to get over any kind of uh, barriers to doing sustainable production, right? So our open data agrology knowledge system has is, is really been key in this, which is interfaces with Dataverse. But as I said, this is also about new knowledge. And that is something that we are at Synod are articulating because in the past it's just been seen, oh, you're doing lovely ad ad adaptive work, conservation agriculture in this particular context, these varieties in a particular context. But there's new ways of knowing and doing that we have discovered through working with communities. For example, in Southern Africa, we were promoting agroforestry and conservation ag with trees, agroforestry. It's wonderful for the soil, provides fuel wood, but these are small plots of land. If you put trees in them, not surprisingly, farmers were not adopting them. On the other hand, we're also promoting improved drought tolerant maize varieties, as you heard on the first day. Those are being taken up fast. This is a food option. But if you just keep doing that, your soil will eventually erode if you just grow maize by itself or with just a small legume by it. So over time, we've discovered that there is other option, a doubled up legume system that has aspects of a tree, right? It's a shrub. It, even one year, it can produce a lot of uh, roots and 
leaves, improve that soil, but it has two crops. There are two food crops there. So it's possible to invest your land in it. So it's not just these two specific crops, although they're two that we actually breed now, pigeon pea and groundnut at Simit, but it's that this is a, is a concept. We could produce other vines and shrubs, which have not been notable in the 10 world's uh, food crops, but we could produce other types like this. So maybe this is a missing piece in sustainable development. And it came through co-developed action science. So in this iterative process to uh, generate new options, new science, I just want to emphasize here that we have both data needs to support these partnerships. Of course, it can be used for decision guides and most of all for a learning agenda. And we haven't always thought about it this way because decision guides, there's many out there. In fact, there's an app called Yap. Have you ever heard of that? Yet another agricultural app. It's a bit sarcastic because in fact, there's hundreds and hundreds of apps there and none of them, well, most of them are not very well used. So we have to be careful we're not bringing maybe a, a very, using data to, to generate exactly the fertilizer rate that, that farmers should use. But what's the inference base that that fertilizer rate recommendation came from? Probably a research farm. What is the farmer's goal? Maybe they're not trying to maximize yield because the profit would be too low, or maybe they want new legumes, not just the maize yield. So we have to be interacting to make sure that these guides support farmers in their own learning. They have their own ways to decide what fertilizers to use, but they often don't understand soil health fully. It's below ground. It's difficult to understand the pests and the beneficial things that go on below ground. So if we tell them about that, that's a learning agenda. So again, what data we collect will matter and what data, how we synthesize it. And then there's very exciting new ways of ICT that farmers in a simple cell phone. And again, one of these exciting things that gets overlooked. Africa, everywhere now, everyone has a phone. It's not necessarily a smartphone, but they can call in and hear a recorded message. They can actually uh, be in WhatsApp groups because it's very cheap to be in WhatsApp there. So there is learning tools that we've never had. And these are also ways to extract data, but also to share data, right? So I, we think of this as in being in part of a big learning cycle. And every step along the way, I don't need you to memorize this cycle. I'm not your professor today, but I do want you to think about data comes in as you, the priority setting with gov local governance, uh, the context dependent, obviously you have to have contexts that are not just the environment, but also the socioeconomic, local farmer preferences, the markets, Obviously, as you do the on-farm experimentation, we need it to be quick, the data generated, and make sure what is the inference zone, and then sharing it with the other. Then we develop it, and re in this iterative cycle of redesign, keep coming up with better and better options. And then it starts over again in terms of the whole cycle. So as we move more into this cycle approach, let me just give you one example of it, how we can use data. In this is the Gaia project. Uh, supported by Gates at Simit, where indeed we started with priority setting, soil health, uh, soil acidity is a big issue in that space, um, using fee fee field trials and feedback loops. And it turns out there's different types of acidity. Soil scientists knew that, but they're just sitting there in their labs looking at soils and not necessarily saying what type of soil acidity, what sort of signals, what sort of very fast ways we can measure it that then can be used to see what types of amelioration we do and target it both at the country level, such things like Lyme, or the very local level options that farmers can actually do. And scaling this out is more and more being tried by different partners because there's been many efforts in the past and they really succeed on local levels, but unless you have improved inference zones and have feedback loops to see what's working where, you're never successful. As they say, pilots never fail, but pilots never scale, right? So the pilots work in this little tiny village, but they don't necessarily scale out. So I think this, this kind of data ecosystem is key to uh, really breaking that development paradigm where we've never scaled. We've not made that much of a difference. And what type of data? Again, coming back to that we need to triangulate data, including comparing it to indigenous knowledge. Often locals do really understand 
why trees are being cut in an area. As a researcher, you may think you know, but it may be a totally different reason why or why they're being planted. Open data, and here I'm obsessed with SOP, standard operating procedures, because how we measure soil, how we measure crops, how our scripts for the different types of models, these need to be published along with data. We all know that, everyone lots of nodding their heads, but how do we do this at scale? Because we still struggle a lot with um, having protocols, but not necessarily having standard operating procedures. Although I've been really excited last few days, people working on this space, synthesizing and sharing data, publishing open data. Uh, again, ever since um, open access of uh, mini papers, uh, dataverse archiving, all these types of things are, are really coming. You can see how popular they are now. And that, and you know, pre-COVID, many people were not yet talking about publishing, pre-publishing, pre-preprints and things. And so it's really exciting to see as we deal with an emergency, we are moving in what I would consider the learning agenda, the action science that we need to. And so just like we have this, doom, what's sometimes called the doomsday vault in Norway to save the world's seeds. And I am super happy that we have that. And I'm sure it helps many of us sleep at night that with these extremes going on that, yes, there's a copy of many of the important germplasm around the world in that uh, frozen north. But where is our doomsday vault for data? You are part of creating that, but I think we need to have, you know, it's somewhat still unfunded mandate. I hate to say that, but it really is. Those of us trying to use the data, finding, you know, we are told we should do the ontologies, we should upload to Dataverse, but then actually making it happen, that's what I'm putting on all of you. And it's important because without figuring out better ways to document all the different types of data um, for the world, this is the seeds of health, seeds of agronomy, of food security, depend on this underpinning of evidence, right? So the question I want to leave you all, and I hope you have a few minutes for questions, is how can open science engage with local expertise? How are we going to start? Let's take a simple example of soils, because I know something about that. The world's soils maps are kind of sketchy for Africa, not surprisingly. Huge continent, hasn't been that many pits dug there. Most of them, soil pits were dug when? When do you think? FAO did them? 1980s. Soils have changed in the last 30 years, 40 years. Um, and yet we have, what we've done is we've updated those and we still have the maps. In fact, they're 30 meter resolution, according to some papers. They're not really. <laughs> There's like, there was 2,000 soil pits dug out throughout the country of Malawi. Malawi is a small country, but it's at the bottom of the Rift Valley, folks. Can you imagine the topology in that country? And we had 2,000 pits dug 40 years ago. Seriously, that's what we're basing it on. And we updated by what? Remote sensing. Very nice for the surface. Guess what? There is not one soil sample on a farmer's field, according to those maps, above 1.5% carbon. My own, you know, we've, we've published recently Global Change Biology on this, showing that, in fact, those positive deviants, farmers that managed to get to 3% carbon, we need to know about them. We need to know about them to predict food security properly, because it's carbon, then tells you about nitrogen release, tells you the ability of maize to respond in um, most years if there's enough water. So this kind of thing has concrete impact on food security, the fact that we don't have good data on soil carbon. Luckily, now we have devices to measure soil carbon in the field fast, and some of them are cheap. They're not perfect, but we can collect data like we've never done before. And you can just repeat this for other topics. But then how do we integrate all that data we're collecting on soil carbon now and pH into the world's repositories on soil data? Supposedly they're there, there's lots of projects to do that, but I promise you they're not there yet. So these are the kind of questions, how are we gonna give indigenous knowledge? And then farmers have their own ways of talking about that soil and how they manage that soil and how do we make sure that it's not just that village, one local expert farmer that knows, but then how do you share that with the world? So that's what I'm looking forward to learning more with you the next few days. And uh, thanks again for this opportunity. We have time for one question? Yeah, any questions to Dr. Snap?
That, that was excellent. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you, though. Looking, I have a background a little bit in social data and economic data, and we talk a lot about the care principles um, based on indigenous rights. I'm curious what your opinion would be of that. You talk about uh, values conflict. How, how do those things relate, and is, are the care principles sufficient for what they do? There's been a number of critiques of care, and I'm on the critique side, I agree. But I'm also an advocate of what? You guys know, you've been with me for a couple of days now. Perfection's the enemy of the good. So if we can get socioeconomic data sets up, we, we don't have ontologies. Our metadata for our surveys are not good. And if there's some out there that we should be using, the TFP or World Bank, let us know. We're struggling here, folks. So I agree. As we go into supporting indigenous knowledge, I had a very sobering thing happen to me when I was in Alexandria years ago. There were some people, we were, we were, it was a meeting on indigenous bridging to so-called science, right? It was like, how do we bridge these knowledge worlds? And an elder from the Salish people of Lummi Island happens to be very near where I was born in the Pacific Northwest. He got up and said, yes, it's good that we have a voice at the table, but guess what? Commercial fishermen just came and have been wiping out abalone in the Pacific Northwest because of geo-referencing of that resource for our communities. So we have to be very, very careful. And so that's just the voice in my head. I applaud the efforts to go beyond fair, and I know there's many, but I also think we need to start getting some of this data, but we have to be very careful to protect people in the process. Thank you for raising that. Well, uh, can you hear me? So uh, I'm originally from Ukraine, and I really like your point about decolonization. And in Netherlands, we are working on a mechanism actually to, um, to do translations of any kind of uh, metadata records simultaneously in any kind of languages. We're thinking that it will help um, to bring everyone together and uh, to work on the science as a, you know, like, like one big community to work on the same thing. I think it's so essential. I haven't mentioned that, but I live here in Mexico. I work for CIMIT. And of course, our records, one of our big challenges is it's Spanglish, it's Spanish and English. So we are working all the time to, you know, get the ontologies right and to make sure that we have it both in Spanish, because otherwise how can people hear or also in Aztec and Mayan. So, you know, it has to be in many languages, but at the same time, English has the international soils and we are a national institute. We are in the middle of that crux every day. So thanks for raising that. Okay, thank you. I don't, yeah, I loved your presentation. Um, I work in a very, uh, yeah, Eunice Mercado, I work for the Open Research Funders Group. Basically, my work is just to find ways to make open science more equitable, which is exactly what you just said. Uh, I have a question. Um, what you are, in the discourse, funders talk a lot about decolonizing all the stuff and how to support minorities and how to create, co-create knowledge with, um, is it recorded? <laughs> Am I, okay. Okay, so they have very good intentions, and I think, would you mind sharing some of some advice on practical examples? How does it look like? Because we speak a lot about it, but we know way less. When you see a funding proposal, what yes. usually what you read is, yes, and we are going to work with locals. Yes. I mean, there's no way I can actually review for it, yeah. or, and I don't know, like, what would it be? you think that we should be observant. I, I think coming back to the gentleman's point about having principles, what that looks like, and some of the new methods, such as digital green and others, where you can share the information back, protecting everyone, but sharing the variability, not just averages, I think is one effort that we're, we're trying to see. So having standards, obviously, that protect people, right? Um, but also that make sure standards and protocols on how these are acceptable ways, just like we have IRBs, we have human subject, uh, you know, standards and protocols. I think we have to have it start to be so as we extract data to get it back to the communities. And then maybe also, of course, we hope it's for the greater good, 
as we co-create. But this is a huge uh, wild, wild west of, of what's going on there. So thanks for, for being an advocate for that. Okay. Thanks so much. Was wonderful. Okay, guys, we are. We do have time. Uh, we're going to actually go ahead and, and, and move along, though, so we can stay on schedule for today. So we're going to start our lightning talk sessions, and we're going to begin with Amber, um, who's going to um, talk on the GDCC sensitive data interest group. Uh, the rest of her collaborators, I want to mention them because they're not here, but we have Katie Mika from Harvard, Sebastian Karcher from QDR, and Cheryl Thompson. So we're going to begin our lightning talk sessions. They're 10 um, minutes each. And actually, Dimitri, I came up here because I meant to say, Dimitri, you have to come do the introductions. So you're up after this to introduce everybody else. <laughs> and just confirming for you who are going to the tour, we're starting at 1 o'clock, the Senate tour in the Germaplasm Bank. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks, Sonia. Hi, everyone. So we're going to get started. We're going to talk a little bit about um, Sensitive Data Interest Group today. Um, so I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the interest group, and I, I just want to give a big thanks to Katie, Sebastian, and Cheryl, who are the... Uh, also the, the co-supporters co of this interest group and, and as well we've had a number of people join us um, for virtual meetings up until today. So we're just going to give a brief overview of kind of what we've learned from across the community. So um, as an interest group, we really are focused on sensitive data that includes human health data. but also other types of sensitive data within Dataverse repositories or the potential to be within Dataverse repositories and discussing opportunities for better support for our communities, for policy development, and for technical advancements and perspectives. And so some of the things we've highlighted and touched on include um, integrations and developments that have um, been in the works for a number of years, uh, many large scale grants and projects um, are underway at many institutions to support better management and sharing of sensitive data in Dataverse or connected to Dataverse. And so we want to highlight, you know, the Data Tags project, which is implementing tagging um, as well as um, supporting um, encryption uh, for sensitive data and ensuring that the classification of that data is respe respected in repositories. We want to highlight the tr trusted remote storage agent project and remote storage um, linking that has been under development uh, in the Dataverse community and exploring the technical and research support areas that can work alongside those technological solutions. We also touch on the existing controlled and mediated access support in Dataverse um, and looking to ways to increase options um, for controlled access to sensitive data in the repository. And then sort of surrounding all of this is this need for um, tech and policy requirements and understanding the, how the technology and the policy come interplay and what policy requirements we're going to need to address and implement in our technological solutions. 
So to date, the interest group has had a number of pre presenters share information about what's happening locally um, and some of the technical uh, solutions that have been developed. So we've had presentations from the Qualitative Data Repository, Harvard Dataverse, the GDCC, from Jim. We've had presentations um, and conversations with Odom at UNC, with Don's, and with Borealis, where I'm at. We talk a lot about our institutions. <laughs> our institutional requirements for regulating, um, you know, access and sharing and management of sensitive data are very important. And so we talk um, about um, how our repositories can fit into those institutional landscapes and what that means to build connections for secure um, data storage, for secure data access, um, for secure data sharing. So, so there's really this emphasis on institutional requirements that's, that's common across many of our organizations. We also talk about national policy and initiatives, including funder policies, but also governance frameworks, including in Canada, we have the TCPS2 governing human subject research. Um, and we have in the United States, the NIH, and HIPAA policies, and in Europe, we have GDPR. So we recognize the need to reflect and integrate with these policies and better support um, standard uh, uh, frameworks uh, for governance of data. So engaging with research ethics boards is also a common element we see here. It's very important. Um, that we respect the roles of the research ethics boards, but each um, organization may do things slightly differently, which makes this difficult for, for integrating into um, you know, standardized software, workflows, you, you name it. Um, so, so how do these ethics boards view um, repositories such as Dataverse? How do they um, set requirements? Um, for researchers to share their data and how does that differ and how can we better um, understand those, those differences to address those challenges and support researchers in obtaining consent for data sharing. Um, similarly with national policies, we see similarities and differences across countries and how does this affect Dataverse developments and best practices. When we talk about controlled access to data, we talk about a whole range of services and commitments um, that we're making to our communities. And so there's a, a, a large sort of emphasis on how do we interface with these existing services and such as virtual enclaves, how may they interact or interface with Dataverse for accessing sensitive data. Um, we also talk about the institutional facilities um, and our, the, the spaces that we exist in and how we all need to come together institutionally to solve these problems. And so th this is sort of um, speaking to the role of the repositories and in the institutions themselves and the historical commitments that say, you know, a department or a library has within that institution to support that. Um, and then we talk a lot about how these types of controlled access services would support researchers and the need for thinking about this from the long term. Um, how do we sustain long term storage for sensitive data? How do we sustain long term access to sensitive data? Um, these are really important things uh, for researchers. So we do, um, we, we do talk a bit about best practices and, and the need to support these researchers, as I just mentioned. And so just to go into a bit more detail, um, we are, many of us are, are talking about our strategies for how we are discussing sharing sensitive data with researchers. So that's really exciting. Um, we also talk about um, 
you know, the importance of these interconnected components to sensitive data sharing, such as de-identification and consent, and the importance of um, data management plans, you know, the REB process, consent forms, and the whole life cycle of research and how that intersects with this. We also um, really recognize, you know, the need to respect ethical and practical and, and, and all these wonderful things that were just spoke about, about inclusivity and balancing the tensions that our funders, journals, repositories, ethics committees um, really have in terms of that, that, that tension between open data and respect for sensitive data management and ethical practices. And one way forward is really this emphasis on guidance and user-focused decision-making tools. So as mentioned, there are many technological innovations and future directions for the Dataverse community, including data tags and encryption and the role of data tags in classifying sensitive data in the repository and the importance of encryption and other te technical requirements. We also see um, the opportunity for remote storage linking as a potential for linking Dataverse with secure remote storage solutions that may already exist across our campuses. We also see the need for advancements in, in automating the data use agreements and the process for achieving or being granted access to data to make things easier for access to secure sensitive data where that's appropriate. Um, we also are addressing the needs for improving security of the Dataverse infrastructure. So there are many challenges, and I spoke to some of the opportunities, um, but I'll just reiterate. So really, it's about navigating this space, the complexity of complying with a variety of regulations and requirements and policy environments is extremely challenging. Um, institutional service gaps exist across all of our institutions for this, this area and identifying and filling those gaps in institutional services for things like long-term data access to sensitive data is a huge challenge. We see collaboration across um, institutional bodies, but also um, beyond. Um, and, and its importance to how we move forward in terms of coming up with solutions that will um, really address the needs of the community, but also um, fit into this larger uh, ethical framework that we, we need to um, respect. So there are um, a number of developments that are underway and we touched on some of them yesterday, including the large data support that may be able to help us with um, sensitive data as well. So that's really exciting. And so we're really interested in continuing those developments and seeing how they can be implemented on the ground. So we will meet again. We're actually going to be meeting today right after this talk um, virtually. So it's a hybrid session. Um, but uh, the sensitive data interest group will continue to meet to share experiences and gather use cases and approaches. We will aim to coordinate on our adoption and improvements of the Dataverse software for different use cases to facilitate fair data across the ecosystem. So we encourage you to join us and learn more about what's happening across our community. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. Uh, please remember that the QA session would be like yesterday after the lightning talks. So for the next one, uh, creating that set with incomplete metadata, why and how, uh, we welcome Dewitcher Blumen, project manager, project manager at Libis uh, from KU Leuven, in Belgium, and Eric uh, Kulikowski, software architect also at Libis. I'm going to have to lower the mic to be able to get to my height. Okay. 
No, I think they're struggling to find our presentation because <laughs> I can see them looking. <laughs> Shall I select it or? Oh, okay. This is the presentation, right? Nope. Um, I think, yeah, that one. Okay, give me a second. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, we're going to be talking about um, how you can create data sets with incomplete metadata and especially why that's useful and how. So, um, we're going to be talking about the API call uh, and what it does and sort of and in case you missed it because it's a feature that was introduced to the software a while ago. Um, we're going to be talking about what it is, why it's useful and some use cases that we have used it for. And then Eric is going to actually dive into how it works a bit more and what to pay attention to when you want to implement it. So, in Dataverse 5.14, a new API call became available uh, where you can create a data set without any of the mandatory metadata. Um, this was the PR call if you want to look it up. And probably some of you have the question that a lot of people had while we were developing this API call, as in, why is that a good thing? And why would we want to create a data set without metadata? Um, so yeah, not everyone was on board, was on board and we weren't quite sure if it was a good idea. So I thought, I thought it made sense to maybe present it today to sort of explain why we did think it was a good idea and why you can, uh, what you can use it for. So what does it do? It's very similar to the native API um, that creates a new draft data set, except that the metadata validation is basically turned off. So the only metadata that will always be present when you use this call, if you don't supply any additional metadata, is one author name, and that's because it's derived from the API token that is used. And um, this lack of validation of the metadata is signaled in the UI. So the data set gets a tag, and it's impossible to publish the data sets unless you provide the mandatory metadata. Uh, so until you have actually filled in the mandatory fields. I hope the video is gonna work. Yeah, so you can see the tag above that indicates that the metadata is incomplete. A warning, and if you try to publish, it's not possible. So we made sure <laughs> that that was also taken care of. Now, why did we need it? So. I think a year and a half ago, we started work on an integration dashboard that would allow us to pull data from existing external data systems into a Dataverse data set. I think we presented it last year. Uh, it's connected with GitLab, GitHub, iRots, I think at this point also OSF, OneDrive, SharePoint, and we continue to build onto it. Um, but we very quickly noticed that it would be very useful that they could move data to an existing draft data set or an already published data set, but that they would also perhaps want to create a new data set and immediately push the data to it. So then the question came, well, we need to enter metadata if we want to do that step, but maybe that doesn't make a lot of sense to actually do that on the moment of transfer because it's actually way more user-friendly to delay it because we only have to write one manual for metadata entry. There's only one UI to maintain and to facilitate. And we don't have to duplicate the UI of Dataverse that our users are already familiar with. So that was our primary reason to use this API call. So this is the um, integration dashboard. <laughs> wow, got kind of lost in it. It's available in open source on GitHub. And as you can see, they can either select an existing data set that is connected to the API token, or they can create a new data set. And when they press that button, it creates a data set via the API without metadata. That's basically where we use this API call for. 
Some other uses that we have since used the API call for uh, was to create a series of the same data set drafts. Uh, we had researchers who had a series of data sets to publish that were all pretty much the same. It was a survey that they did twice a year for 20 years, and they wanted to publish all those data sets. Um, and we could basically just have one JSON that didn't have all the necessary mandatory fields because some were different, like the title, and we could just generate 37 data sets with one static JSON file, and they could just supply the metadata that was slightly different. Now, some of you might say, well, we have templates in Dataverse. That's absolutely right, but I think they're not as useful if you just want to use it once on one day to create a bunch of data sets, um, especially because in our instance, our users cannot create templates because that's a right that they do not have. Um, and then another one that is useful to know of, if you add a new mandatory metadata field or you change the optional status of an already existing field to mandatory, then the tag is gonna allow you to filter on all the data sets that don't have the field that is now mandatory in there. Um, there was a bit of a bug there that I think made it appear on more data sets than it should have, as in it was shown publicly, that has been fixed in the PR. Uh, but yeah, so that was kind of the uses that we have for it. And then um, I think, if I remember correctly, it's now up to Eric to explain how it works. Uh, so by default, uh, it's not turned on, so you you cannot create any data sets without uh, metadata. So if you want to use this feature, you have to turn it on. And uh, yeah, it's documented, so uh, quite easy to find. And uh, there is also another feature which might, might be useful depending on uh, how your curating flow is set up. Uh, so it might be possible that you have someone that could fill out the metadata for you. So when you create one without metadata, you could send it for review and the reviewer could help you out with filling the gaps. Uh, what's important, it's really only um, meant for integration flows. So it's uh, not that you can create uh, data sets without all the metadata with UI. It's API only feature. Um, so there is also documentation how to do that and uh, it explains how the call should look like and uh, how to use the, this feature. So check out the documentation if you are planning to use that. And one important thing uh, is re-indexing. So how the feature is implemented is to prevent bloating of the dataverse. Uh, we want to keep things efficient. Uh, so if you say like validating step of metadata, it's done only once when the data set is being indexed. So it's one of the steps of indexing. So if you do not re-index uh, your metadata, then your installation would, wouldn't know which data sets have all valid metadata and which not. So you really need to re-index all your data sets after enabling this feature. And then, as Diverche mentioned already, you could end up with metadata that's incomplete in your Dataverse installation without using that feature. Like you did something to your metadata structure and then some of your data sets are suddenly incomplete. And the question was like, what can you do about it? Can you detect which metadata, uh, which data sets have this problem? So there is another feature you can turn on and it would also show incompleteness tag on the data sets that are uh, relevant and even on the published one. So by default, you only have this tag on draft data sets. So we assume you never have published data sets with incomplete metadata, but when it happened, you can turn this feature on and then only the people with access to the data sets, like they really can do something about it, would see that tag on a published data sets. So typically you would go to my data tab 
And then you have also filters when you can say I only want to see incomplete uh, metadata and you can start fixing uh, the data sets that have that problem. And uh, once again, reindexing is important, especially when you change something to your uh, metadata structure. It's, it, you really have to reindex everything, so it takes account to the account the changes and uh, computes the right tags and such. But uh, one thing, uh, why is yet another feature for seeing incomplete NAS tag on uh, published data sets is also about efficiency. So the check is we only want to show this tag on published data sets for people that have access to those data sets. So it's action, uh, they can really fix it, so do something about it. But that's also extra calls in the background. So it's advised to turn off this feature once you fix the data sets and uh, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So thank you for your attention. So thank you for next presentation. Divacio would stay here, and we'll welcome uh, Özgür Karadeniz, also from Libis, uh, in Belgium, where he's a software architect. And don't worry, this time it's only two presentations, <laughs> not four like in last year. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> Okay, so the next presentation uh, is about something I was going to say entirely different, but that's not true because it also has a lot to do with metadata. So uh, we've created a Dataverse AuroCrate exporter with the support of the FAIR impact call. So what I'm going to be talking about is the FAIR impact call that we actually participated in, uh, what the scope of the project was like, uh, and then the road to the Auro RO create metadata exporter that Usgur has been working on and sort of the next steps of uh, RO create and Dataverse, how we see it or what's possibly uh, on the map there. So fair impact, uh, this was, uh, this is a project, I think it's a continuation of fair sharing, if I remember correctly, at least it's one of the fair projects. Fair is fair. I knew it has an S in it, but I didn't know where. Um, and they have a bunch of smaller support calls that they um, organize every now and then to provide some uh, small funding to help set up integrations or to get support on a relatively small scale. The call that we participated in uh, launched June or May 2023, and it was called Enabling Fair Signposting in Our Crate for Content, Metadata Discovery and Consumption. Uh, now, signposting was introduced in Dataverse over the summer, so that wasn't really something we could work on, uh, so we picked the AuroCrate part. So, AuroCrate is a uh, community approach to packaging research data with their metadata, and it's very much based on the schema.org standard, and it's using JSON-LD, though it allows for a lot of flexibility, especially when you have fields that are difficult to map to certain standards. For the Auro Create part within Fair Impact, uh, we got a lot of support by Stian Soiland Race, if I said it correctly, who works at the University of Manchester, who is kind of the expert when it comes to Auro Create, and he was also very interested in an integration between Dataverse and Auro Create. So the aim was to learn more about Auro Create and uh, how we could possibly integrate it with the Dataverse software. We were not the only ones that uh, were chosen to take part in the project. 
Um, for example, the Staki team in Hungary also took part, so we had a lot of discussions with them on how to move forward. Uh, our focus was very particularly on the very broad and general into, uh, integration of it, uh, while theirs were very much on their case-specific ones because they had a lot of integrations with uh, Cedar, which had some specifications in it which were not applicable for all Dataverse um, installations, but was still very interesting to learn more about. So, the project is relatively small. It's only three months, uh, and the well, three to four months. And the goal is to, uh, for us to create a broad or general our create implementation in Dataverse that is not installation specific. Our focus was very limited because of the short scope of the project. So we decided to uh, create an Aura Create Preview, which is what Eric has worked on. Uh, this was relatively easy because there was already an open source HTML Preview available. We just had to implement it. We did discuss it with the ELN consortium because the ELN format is actually based on Aura Create. So they were very interesting to see uh, what we would be doing with it. And then the more complicated one that we also worked on was the Aura Create metadata exporter, which was schema.org org based. So the road to an RO create metadata exporter for Dataverse is something that my colleague will be talking more about. So uh, our uh, efforts for the exporter focused on the RO create uh, metadata.json uh, file which is the uh, file that's uh, in the heart of the uh, AroCrate format, and uh, it consists of the metadata uh, file descriptor for the file, the root data entity, uh, which is, which is the, our data set in this case, zero or more data entities, which is the file and directory hierarchy, and zero or more contextual entities, which are the external entities. So the root data entity can be uh, the identifier, URL, publication date, the fields that we um, know from the dataset metadata, the familiar fields. And the contextual entities are more like the external entities, which are the persons, organizations, and licenses. And, and these can be referred to by the root data entity. For example, a person can be the author of the uh, dataset or can be referred to from the other contextual entities, like the organization can be, for example, uh, the affiliation of a person. And also, as a side note, uh, entities can be both contextual and data entities, uh, such as licensed. Uh, so here, the interesting challenges emerge from the root data entity and the, and the contextual entities, because uh, here were the problems with the mapping from uh, uh, the metadata from uh, Dataverse, uh, the site, uh, the metadata blocks uh, to our create uh, fields uh, emerge. And so here the question becomes uh, a perfect uh, mapping is not possible because of the differences between the metadata we find in Dataverse and, and versus the, what our create expects from us. And the question is, uh, uh, the uh, trade-offs and choices, do we need to make them uh, instead of the user, or we give them a choice about this. Uh, so there emerged a few uh, uh, design decisions. We prioritize easy customizability by the users for their installation. We decided to use a single CSV file, which is human readable and editable uh, using your spreadsheet program. And we wanted to use the metadata blocks and the, all the, and the metadata fields that are already available in Dataverse uh, that can be found in the Excel document, human readable Excel document. And uh, mostly by default, we use citation data, metadata block, but uh, we also wanted other metadata blocks uh, to be able to be used. And uh, we also wanted to make this an external exporter Dataverse from 5.14 uh, supports the external exporters, uh, which can be installed in the form of a jar file. So, uh, so our contribution is uh, purely optional, and the users are free to use it or not. So 
So this is what the CSV file for customization looks like. And I want to uh, talk about this a little bit uh, and how we approach this. Um, for example, here you see the root entity. Oh, OK, what did I do? Okay, I pressed the wrong button. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think I won't be able to use the <laughs> uh, pointer. Uh, my apologies. And yeah, and the first field you see is the target entity, which is the, uh, the entity, in this case, the root entity. And second field, you see the target property name, which will be the properties that appear for this entity in the output uh, JSON file. And uh, the, the double underscore is co converted to at uh, to make Excel users' lives a bit easier. And the next field is if there's a fixed value you want for that entity uh, in, a, in a string format, then uh, you put that value there. And uh, the refers to field uh, is used when this entity refers to another contextual entity that is described here. And the next is the source, and it can be empty for the data set uh, uh, metadata at the root level, or it can be a certain citation block and it can be uh, metadata from the data set version. For example, here, license is, uh, uh, comes from the license field from the data set version. Uh, it uses the URL property, and uh, it also refers to the, I, uh, it is also the ID of another contextual I entity uh, named license. And here's another example, uh, the author entity, and you see the type is fixed, uh, it will always be a person. And uh, the source is a metadata uh, block uh, named citation, and the field is author. So this means that for each author in the citation metadata block, the, uh, the fields in the property name, ID type, affiliation, etc., will be populated uh, using the uh, property names you see in the last column. And uh, so uh, what you can do here is if you uh, want to change something like uh, the old, for example, if you want to use author identifier instead of the author name, you just type in there, edit the file, and then uh, you have a different way to export this. Oops. Saved it. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that was a step. Okay, so the next step for our Create and Dataverse, as we said at the beginning, the scope of the FAIR Impact project is very small. Um, so we focused on that timeline and what we could kind of feasibly achieve within it. But of course, there are more opportunities between our Create and Dataverse. Um, our first step is to implement the exporter in Dataverse and make sure that we document, document it well. I think we're pretty close to making the PR. Um, but then we're also going to look into a more in-depth AuroCreate integration, uh, which means sort of a full ingest, full export, including the files, because the exporter is purely on metadata, while the AuroCreate system principle can be including the files. Uh, the difficult thing here is that there are many use cases to keep in mind, uh, define and sort of weed out to figure out which ones to include in a general imp implementation and which ones not. And it's really going to be necessary to collaborate on this because I think the use cases that we think of are probably not going to be all of them. And uh, I believe there are other institutions that are also interested in working on it. Um, so the idea that we've been playing with now for the ingest flow, as I like to call it, is that an hour is uploaded, which has metadata and files, that it gets ingested and mapped into the standard Dataverse data set with the folder structure and the metadata though not everything will always be able to map, so that will be a challenge. What do you do with the non-mappable features and, and elements? Then what happens if someone edits the data set in Dataverse after the ingest, uh, and how do you then export that data set as a full AuroCrate package? If you look at the three steps separately, they should be doable, but if you want to 
sort of cover the use case where someone goes through every single step with a data set, it becomes a lot more tricky. So that's why we think there's a collaborative effort necessary to really figure out the functional side of how do we want it to work. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we still have ahead of us. So anyone who also wants to join in on this kind of work, I don't think it'll be a matter of months, but rather perhaps a couple of years, worst case scenario, um, let us know, because I'm sure we've had some conversations with others already. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, it's working now. Uh, for the next presentation, we are going back to the Americas with Seeking Excellence in Data Preservation, the trajectory of the first Brazilian repository for cultural skills uh, certification, presented by René Faustino Gabriel Jr. from the Universidad Federal do Rio Grande do Sul and IBICT, which is the Brazilian Institute of Technological and Scientific Information. Thanks. Hello, um, waiting. Well, seeking excellence in data preservation, the trajectory of the first Brazilian repository for cultural seal certification. Okay. Change. But, um, I work in, uh, in university, university and uh, do working to IBECT, IBICT, né? the Instituto Brasileiro de Informação em Ciência e Tecnologia is a national information board research uh, unit of Brazilian Ministry of Science. Our goal is promote competence, development of research and information infrastructure in science and technology for the production, socialization, and integration of science and technology college, technology. The transfer of information technology is one of the actions that consolidate the IBICT was a reference in the area in Brazil and abroad. Hello? Okay. To promote the open science in, in data sharing in Brazil, uh, DBICT creates two repositories uh, institutional. Uh, the first is the ALEA the, for IBICT research, and another, uh, the Posita Dados for small institution, institutions without repositories. ALEA is the official repositories do Instituto Brasileiro de Informação em Ciência e Tecnologia. Né? The, repo the repositories stores, publish, disseminate, preserve, and share data sets produced, produced by the institutional research and technicals. Tá? The ALEA uh, repository was launched in November 2023. The ALEA was building in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. It's goal to promote, support, facilitate the use the open access to research data, encourage new research to deposit data, promote open science in Brazil. The EBICT and RNP promote other institutions to create institutional data, data repository with infrastructure, support, and training. In order to create an institutional repository, the institution, institutions must institutional, institutional support, research office, information technology support, library support, E participation of researchers. Many repositories are being incubated 
in Brazil, né? and some have already gone into production. Okay? But our repositories sustainable, sustainable, sustainable in a long term? To answer this question, we uh, searched for an international certification that attested to the reliability and susten sustainability of data repository in terms of long-term preservation and access. Our arm is to be a first repository certificate with a CTS in Brazil. Uh, a, a working group was created to analyze and prepare documentation to meet the uh, 16 CTS requirements. Uh, the, the teams, né, the group, uh, is composed by Katarina uh, Samili, uh, was professor, uh, Tatiane Cassio e, e Washington, segundo, tá, and me, Rene. Um, the group is a multidisciplinary team. Né? The, the group meets online weekly, Tá? for eight months to study other certificate repositories, study the CTS requirement for defined policy and preparation documentation, establish new procedures that didn't exist in our institution, the BICT. It was necessary to adapt some requirements to comply with Brazilian legislation and regulation. Our, our documents were reviewed by the institutional management. All documents are translated uh, into, into English. Uh, the repository was created in Portuguese, English, and Spanish. Consideration. The certific certification is important for Brazilian community. Both done the experience is in process and how certification benefits the sustainability and the ALEA repository. We submit to review in September 2023 and I uh, and are waiting review, né? but it is uh, still under review yet. Né? The challenge facet uh, and lesson learned were documented and shared our communities. Training course are being prepared to Brazilian communities for CTS certification. EBICT's goal is to prepare other Brazilian repositories to obtain this certificate. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. For our last uh, presentation, which will be about increasing community collaboration to make and evaluate user-centered design risk decision, uh, we'll welcome Julian Gauthier, which I assume most of the community already know, who is a product research specialist at Harvard's IQSS. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. That's not it. <laughs> I don't know if I should try or should I let?
No, no comments. I can control it with that. Yep. Bold. Or both. Bold work. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. So my name is Julian. I'm at uh, I'm at Harvard um, University um, with the team at IQSS. Um, and today's talk is uh, well, my lightning talk is uh, about increasing collaboration, um, community collaboration for making uh, user-centered design decisions. Um, so I, I, I just wanna go over uh, the, the goals of this lightning talk, um, some disclaimers, um, uh, a bit about uh, UX research, um, um, and I'll share relevant parts of my background um, as a way to uh, mitigate um, my own biases. Um, which are affecting how I think things should be done and, and how I think things could be done. Um, and um, so I, I should, uh, I, I wanna share uh, the reasoning for this UX working group or, or the idea of it, um, progress and next steps. Um, like I said, I'll share my background um, and just you know, thoughts and opinions are my own. They don't re represent uh, um, uh, the thoughts and opinions of, of, of the community or the folks who've, who I've spoken with as, as part of, of this uh, exploration of a UX working group or my employer. Um, so I've been working on, on, on Dataverse for about seven and a half years. Um, and uh, my real interest is in, as, as a user experience researcher, so informing design with different research methods. Um, a lot of that has been towards uh, working on the on metadata and metadata design. Um, I also work on the curation team and the support team at Harvard Dataverse. Um, that's given me a lot of insight into um, uh, different kinds of users uh, at that repository. Um, so uh, I'm taking uh, this definition from, of UX research from the Interaction Design Foundation, which is the systematic study of target users and their requirements to add realistic context and insights to design processes. Um, and so I, a big part of that is, is systematic studies. Um, and so I've, I've been promoting it uh, because I think the, the quality of our shared understanding of users leads to quality decisions, um, solutions, and outcomes. Um, I think myself and, and, and the community in general, I, I think if I were to uh, redesign this talk after today's conference, I, you know, it, it would be a bit different because I've, I've already learned a lot about what different groups are doing and how different groups are thinking. Um, about um, their next steps in, in the development of, of, of Dataverse and the things that they're contributing to. Um, but I think we need to more quickly improve the quality of, of Dataverse uh, by more quickly developing an understanding um, that's more widely shared. Um, that's already being done and, and there are challenges. Um, a lot of this is, is uh, um, provocative. I, I hope it's not too provocative, but I, I think, you know, why, why do communities um, or why do software products uh, commit any resources to doing research to, uh, uh, to make decisions about how, what they build? Um, and um, and I and I and I've applied that to you know why do we or why don't we commit enough resources to um, to doing that doing that research um, and I think that users hate change so in in this in this case you know the users are um, you know while the community's grown uh, changing how we work like any changes is hard there are groups within the community that have signed up with ex expectations um, about how we work 
and changing what's expected means different things for different members. Um, it might mean, you know, finding uh, um, different kinds of resources, changing their timeline, just changing expectations about how they can contribute and, and, and continue to contribute. Um, so I, I call this captive audiences. For some organizations that choose Dataverse, uh, the people who are meant to use it um, are required to use it after that decision has been made. Um, this is similar to um, enterprise software, which is notorious for its usability issues and stagnation. Um, I think one reason for this is because target users of these solutions are, are quote unquote captive audiences. So once the solution is chosen, um, users must use it and adoption becomes less of a, of a concern. Um, and it's one less reason to prioritize, uh, you know, usability and, and especially, you know, rapid iteration, which leads to stagnation. Um, um, I think, I, I wonder sometimes if, if the ways in which we're funded contribute. Um, from what I can tell, and I'm only speaking again from my experience at, at, at Harvard, I know that there are lots of uh, ways in which contributors of, of Dataverse are being funded. Um, but from my experience, the funding that we get almost never mandates that we demonstrate how well the things we're funded to build are working, only that we make a change and that, and that we ship something. And of course, you know, everyone has, you know, can look at what was built um, and have an, and, you know, and, 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 and have an opinion. Um, as, as far as I know, only once in, in, my, in my seven years at the Dataverse team have we agreed as part of grant funding to hypothesize and measure the effects of the changes that we were, fund, that we were giving funded to make to Dataverse. Um, it was related to file previewers. And um, I might be wrong, but I, you know, but then I'd say that the, the requirements to, to measure outcomes aren't shared widely. Um, so if, if the funding keeps coming as long as something has changed and not necessarily as a demonstration of the quality of that, of that change, it makes sense that uh, making changes is what gets prioritized. Um, OSS is for technical folks. Uh, in, in, in UX communities, open source communities are regarded stereotypically as developer heavy and geared towards more technical users. Um, this, is change, this has changed a lot. But I, I, I still think that there is that, that stereotype. Um, just think of like open source operating systems. Um, I'm not saying that this is as true as it was before, uh, um, but I think that it might influence the resources that we think we need in order to maintain the health of Dataverse. Um, I call this the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And that's a image of a very uh, squeaky wheel. Um, so if, if no one's complaining, everything must be fine. I don't think that anyone really believes that. But I think that this idea is used, I, I wonder if this idea is used as a way to manage expectations when, when folks feel like there are no resources to develop and evaluate a shared understanding before, during, and after designing and implementing solutions. Um, and the last of, of, and these are all just like theories uh, or ideas that I have about, um, you know, what the challenges are in committing resources to, 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 uh, to this. Um, it's my party. <laughs> so the nature of, of OSS might encourage the idea that the group contributing the most resources to addressing a need should have the most influence over how that need gets addressed. Um, so the idea of a, work, of a UX working group uh, came from Stefano. Um, although I think you know, in, there, there have been there have been talks, you know, in, in, in I think you know, as early as 2016 um, community meetings about thinking of ways to scale UX research by leveraging more of the community's uh, research resources. I think um, I use uh, the the word more quickly very often because I know that, that this work is already being done. We, you know, we, we've seen, uh, you know, in today's lightning talks, 
um, in yesterday's talks, in the in the in the working group meetings, um, efforts to uh, to improve our shared understanding and make decisions based off of that. Um, but we think that by forming a working group, uh, this might help us leverage more of the community's resources. Um, I also think that uh, we'll feel better about making decisions more quickly and based on an understanding of user goals and pain points that will never be complete when we feel uh, more confident in our ability to improve that understanding over time uh, when we feel that we have the resources to do that by evaluating ideas and, uh, and, the, and the solutions that we implement and um, by using that improved understanding to improve our solutions and, and you know, and the cycle continues. Um, so, so far, uh, you know, I, I think when this, this, this idea of a UX working group was discussed, um, we did, a, we had a draft charter, um, uh, brainstormed some ideas about how the UX working group might work. Um, uh, that's a, that's a link. So when you get the, when you get the, um, these slides, you can see the draft charter. Uh, um, I wrote that the group's purpose would be to help inform the design of Dataverse software and services. And this could involve collaborating on user research to help um, make informed design decisions and creating and, and promoting best practices. Um, I, I approach this like I would approach anything where I'm being asked to help design something um, where I want to understand the community's current practices and thoughts about UX research. Um, I think that, you know, it, it's possible that, uh, that a working group might not even be the best uh, solution. Um, but uh, what I want is to, you know, implement a solution that will, will, will work best um, for the community and where, where, the, where the outcomes of that of that solution, if it is working group, working group, are measurable over time. Um, so, from October through our de December of last year, I had uh, uh, interviews, chats, really, with uh, the core development team at IQSS, or um, well, with most of them. Um, I shared uh, those findings, um, those insights, in a group group thread. Um, I also, I don't have it here, but I also talked, I also spoke with, um, a, you know, a, one or two uh, um, contributors, groups that have contributed uh, uh, features or improved features on, on Dataverse to learn, um, you know, their current practices and, the, and their thoughts and their, and their pain points, things to, you know, we, we would want to avoid. Um, my next steps are to, um, continue publicizing the idea of a working group, um, continue to research to learn from more groups. There are groups that I think are, uh, that I've missed and whose, whose, um, whose uh, thoughts I think will be really uh, in, uh, necessary to learn from. Um, and then uh, sharing those findings and, and, and recommendations. Um, I should also say that, oops, sorry. Um, you know, I, I want to thank uh, Kaylin and Sonia for uh, helping me think through this. I think it's a it's a it's a big task, um, and for uh, you know putting a um, helping me you know define define this better and to put you know to put deadlines around it. Um, one of the things I didn't say that might be a pain point when people think about UX research is that it never ends. Right, and the fear that like it'll just keep going, and eventually you have to make a decision, right? Um, and and so I, and I don't want I don't want while I'm thinking about this as a as a research project, like I would any other, they do have to be deadlines. They do have to be, um, you know, and, and publicized so folks can expect something, even when we know that it might not be, you know, the perfect solution. Um, and we'll know that we'll have time. Uh, we'll know that we'll be able to iterate on that solution if we agree on. On, on what the outcomes uh, should be, regardless of the solution. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. We'll now have the 
QA and panel. Uh, Six, how many? Six. Yeah, thank you all for those great presentations. Now, yeah. Um, so now, as already said, we're moving to the Q and A question. So, are there any burning questions in the audience? Yes, Sherry. Um, it's not okay. Um, this is for Julian. I just wanted to know how. Your research or what you've been finding is um, interacting or, or collaborating with Ellen and the UI components group. <laughs> is this thing on? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, I I've tried to. I've been more. Um, I've been in the working groups. Uh, that Ellen is leading for the, um, we're the working group that, or the interest group now that Ellen is leading um, for the UI components, um, which I think is, is front end development. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I think that's still being settled. You know, like I want to be aware of, like I think that I want to be aware of, there, there, you know, there are different groups, contributing groups. Um, that are that are part of that interest group that that, that have showed up regularly, um, and I want to be aware of of their development processes, and that includes you know how they how they make decisions. Um, I also I also think and I and I just thought of this during this morning's interest group um, about how um, the new SPA and, and how that's developed can. Uh, contribute to uh, you know a, a faster feedback loop, um, you, know, um, you know, in cases where you know you you want high fidelity, I guess you want to you want to show people working code, or you know, and and versus like when you think that you you it would be better um, to show people you know paper prototypes or stuff in in Figma or you know like. Things that are that that don't, that don't take a developer to demonstrate how something might work, and to be able to generate a lot of ideas and show those ideas to users. Um, so that that's just something that occurred to me now, like just being aware of of that interest group and what in, in its work. Um, I think will be helpful when we think about um, you know promoting you know I guess promoting best practices and and and, and strategies for. Uh, gathering different sorts of, of feedback when, when we make decisions about how things are designed. 
Thank you. Well, it seems there are no other question yet, so I have, uh, yes. Hi, sorry, Julie, another one for you. Hello? Yeah. So yeah, another question for you or another or comment, really. I think it's great that you're doing this. And if you look at, I think it's a, obviously a significant weakness of many open source software projects that they don't think about users at all. Uh, I, I think I, uh, end users anyway, iRods is a classic example of a fantastic product, which is, doesn't have a UI, so they don't need to worry about it. It's only for developers. Omiro is um, maybe somewhere in the middle. Um, it's, they don't really think very much about users or usability. Uh, and it's, it's not great, uh, but it's got a lot of good functionality. So I think that what you're doing will really help. Uh, it's a huge challenge for the reasons you said and, and not easy, but I think trying to move Dataverse in this direction will really help to further make Dataverse stand out as kind of uh, uh, an open source software project, which is also much more, comes across as much more professional uh, in a way. So it's, uh, so good luck. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we spoke a bit. Um, I do, I do think that, a, you know, people who use the API and don't use the graphical user interface are users too, and developers are users too, and and the growth will come, you know, from the work that um, that has been done um, to improve the developers' experience to make it easier for them to contribute. Um, and then, but you know, I, I do. It is interesting to think. To, I, I wonder if like the reasons why folks who don't use uh, um, graphical user interfaces, that's not how they interact with Dataverse. Um, if, if, if we feel like the usability isn't as prioritized because I just wonder why that is. Like are they less, are they more tolerant of design issues? You know, where, and it's just like a, maybe it's just a, you know, when I, when I use the API and I'm not a developer, but I, but I try to use the API for more, more quantitative research. And when I do, and, and when I find an, a, you know, something that isn't intuitive about the API, for example, I, I don't open a GitHub issue right away and complain. Like I just, it's, a, it's kind of a puzzle for me to, you know, and, 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 when, I, and when I understand, when I get my, my mental model matches the mental model of, of how the API works, it, that, that is, a, um, I feel good about that, you know? It's like, I feel better about myself. Like, oh, I could figure this out and now I can, you know, do things at scale and, and collect all this information that I didn't have access to before. So, I, yeah, I mean, like, I don't, I, don't, I don't think I, I do know that, like, yeah, open source communities, especially ones that, are, are, that don't have UIs, um, the stereotype is that they're, they don't prioritize usability. Um, I don't think that's the case, but I do wonder why that, why that, why we get that impression, right? Hi, so um, I just wanted to say in response to Julian's um, work is that, you know, right now with the um, SPA development, our first iterations have been following the, the UI of the JSF interface because we want to, um, you know, do some rapid de development, um, get the new front end going and workable but we are developing this iteratively, and I'm hoping that as um, Julian gets more information from the community, you know, we can talk about that, and if there are like specific usability issues that we can incorporate as we continue developing, that would be a really great thing. So I'm hoping we can coordinate this information from the community with the new development on the front end. Thank you. Um, I'll ask uh, my question to Rene before I pass to the next question to the audience. Um, so you mentioned that a few repositories were in the process of creation and asked the question of the suitability of such repositories. Uh, in this context, what were the reasons to have by the same institution a repository for the institution and a separate repository for the institution that doesn't that don't have uh, an institutional repository. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, in a context where you're not sure about the sustainability of various repositories, and as you mentioned, it's a big effort to have them certified and being trusted. Uh, what was the reasoning of keeping uh, repositories from various institutions separate? What were, our, in your context, the identity? In, in, in Brazil, we have uh, many kinds of institutions, many kinds of uh, research, um, research institution, then, uh, uh, and um, until university have uh, your finance, uh, your money, uh, uh, is uh, the areas different. So in Brazil, we prefer to create many repositories uh, and uh, concentrate all uh, um, uh, meet, uh, re, uh, meeting and reunion, uh, reunion uh, meeting and. Uh, um, a big aggregate, 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 aggregator tá? is a uh, Oasis BR, is a uh, um, mine repository to revest, revesting uh, anti repository and join uh, in a Brazilian uh, territory. Tá? Então, then uh, anti university have. Uh, uh, can decide what, what do you implement, what do you policy um, in them in the big to coordinate our repositories uh, metadata. metadata. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, hello. Okay, thank you. Uh, talk about the repositories. Uh, which requirements do you need to consider to create a repository in an organization or an in any institution? Example, talk about security, talk about sensitive data, talk about uh, availability, capacity, performance. Thank you. Um, uh, how we say uh, in, in in Brazil, Brazil, we have a um, um, repository networking. Uh, then uh, we have uh, many meetings for years, many trainings for years. Then uh, uh, the the EPIC goes to prepare to support to to um, possibility the the uh, until university uh, decide with create uh, uh, any any institution for example create a thematic repositories another uh, um, create a, a department repositories uh, have ten types of repositories in Brazil. Uh, the the few crews uh, have uh, 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 um, many places, uh, many uh, then uh, the repository uh, join our research in few crews. So have many many policies, many kinds of data, many them uh, we prefer uh, uh, to. To possibility the university decides about it. Do you want to add uh, other elements for the other installations as Borelis or KU Leven? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I think uh, the institutional based approach has also been our experience, um, given that it's our closest closest alley in terms of the services we offer to researchers. Obviously, we're all employed by institutions <laughs> and a lot of larger collaborations that happen around best practices, guidelines, preservation are very much alive and, and in development. Um, but largely, those services are um, 
rooted in our institutions. And so I think that has been our experience as well in Canada with Borealis. I think the technology is there though to support some centralization when appropriate, um, leverage you know efficiencies at scale. It's great to do that kind of work, but the service supports are local and they have local needs and different languages and different departments and there's such a variety of needs um, that they need to support. So we offer a common framework, you know, where we can come together, a network similar in Brazil, yeah. Thank you. Any other question? Well, in the meantime, I'll ask a question about our crate exporter. I might be totally wrong, but I think Croissant Format has many similarities with uh, our crates. And I was wondering if one of the perspectives to move the our crate forward would be some kind of mutualization of the work being done to support croissant to come back in into our crate implementation or if there is even an harmonization or reusing the work you already done um, we uh, considered uh, uh, considered some, uh, uh, working about croissant uh, the uh, uh, joined one of their meetings, uh, but in the end we uh, ended up uh, focusing on just our upgrade. Uh, but uh, of course, this uh, remains a possibility until uh, after we finish our uh, work with our upgrade, uh, the exporter. Uh, I believe that Stian is also joining a lot of the croissant meeting, so I, I think he's keeping an eye on what's possible there. But as far as I know, there's currently not really an integration between the two or a very... They're not completely the same. So they're, they're similar, but they're not the same. So they can't replace each other, I believe. Thank you. Yeah, just, just to follow up on the croissant stuff, the official launch is supposed to be 33 minutes from now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we'll hear more from Google about that um, format. And, um, yeah, I, I joined the call as well. We basically were talking about um, differences between the RO crate and croissant. And I think they're different enough that we need to have separate implementations. I actually started working a little bit on an implementation of croissant. It's not done. It's a community meeting. It's been a distraction. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I think that just as sort of an FYI, uh, this is all on a GitHub issue that, that we could look up, but uh, croissant seems to be like the next generation of what Google wanted from us for uh, Google dataset search. So they're basically saying, we want you to use croissant and put that in like the head of the HTML pages and uh, if there's anything that breaks, we'll fix it. So that's how I'm thinking about croissant now, at least from our perspective, it's sort of like that, the next generation of that format we used. It's called uh, schema.org JSONLD in the GUI. I hope that helps a little bit. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah, th um, this is for Eric, um, just about the um, incomplete metadata. I was just wondering if the steps that you outlined in your slide have more details sort of documented someplace. I'm trying to figure out why re-indexing is needed or did you figure that out by accident? Uh, no, not by accident. So when we index data sets, uh, we store the index in solar and uh, uh, it's how I implemented uh, this feature so it's one of the solar field fields that actually uh, tells if the metadata is complete or not so that's why you have to index after turning on the feature this feature so, so that uh, solar gets the needed information and uh, why solar it's also the way around when we query um, uh, for data sets. So when you have my data uh, tab, there you have also on the left side filters. 
And uh, so when you click on one of the filters, then, then the query to the solar is made efficient. And actually, you query for, like, for example, only complete, complete or incomplete metadata. I think the recommendation in the slide, uh, it was good that it's generic. It's a step that sometimes gets forgotten to always re-index when there's a metadata modification anyway. But I think, I don't know if it's already out, there's a new guide about uh, modifying metadata that emphasizes those steps that might be forgotten. Yeah, I did put it. that in the documentation. So initially I did not, and then uh, Phil was playing with it, and uh, he, he, his data was gone in the, my data page and it's like, yeah, you should probably index first. Oh yeah, I should put that in the documentation. So, yeah. Thank you. Any other question? Ah. Um, have you been in touch with the folks at OJS who are working on, or were working on the updating their integration between Dataverse and, and OJS. Because I think one of the earlier discussions that they had when they were looking on, you know, updating it for the newer versions of Dataverse was um, being able to push, create data sets in Dataverse repositories and with that, with incomplete metadata, right? For the reasons that you that you mentioned, um, having you know, asking authors to continue editing in in the dataverse form instead of having to reduplicate that on the OJS side. Um, but I, but I think I guess if you haven't. It looks like you haven't. Then uh, not specifically, but that, that's how the feature was. What is it meant for? It's not just for our tool. So we kept the scope. Like anybody can use it. And in our opinion, it facilitates all integrations, uh, whatever tool you are using. And uh, the metadata editing stays in Dataverse where the users are familiar with. And, uh, so that was the goal. And yeah, hopefully it will get wider usage. So that's why we also thought to present it here. So people, people are more aware that it exists and can be used. Yeah, I think maybe it's also important to point out that the initial need for the integration dashboards was because of the integrations with systems like OSF weren't working the way they should. Or a lot of, I think, other data systems were like, well, it's very difficult to do the metadata part of a Dataverse integration. So um, that was also the initial reason why we even started on the road to that connection integration dashboard. But we haven't had contact with OGS specifically about this. Oh. Sorry, another follow-up thing. This is for OSF, Open Science Framework. Um, they're trying to schedule a meeting to talk to us. I think it's going to be me, Sherry, and Sonia, and maybe you guys can come as well to talk about kind of reinvigorating this integration. Um, it'll be like within the next couple of weeks, but find me, I'll, I'll get you the Doodle link or whatever. I think it'd be great to have you. Yeah, we also recently actually had a call with the people from OSF, um, but I think it was in the context of their move to open source and sort of setting up the community a bit stronger there. And I used it to point out that the integration was broken. But <laughs> So I have mentioned this, but I'm definitely interested in getting it to work from all directions so that no matter what the user is most familiar with, they can make the connection between the systems. So I would be interested in joining, absolutely. Um, so maybe it's interesting, so the RDM uh, integration dashboard is open source and it has a plugin architecture. So. Like, for example, when we want to add some integration, we can do it very fast, and, uh, but it's open source and we are very open. 
if someone has something specific and would like to contribute, please, please do. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Is that, so we, yesterday we heard about research commons and, and the popularity of that. Would you classify like the dashboard as, as a research commons? I think it's, it could be a tiny step in the entirety of the research commons. Uh, we're actually one of the partners that is also involved in the recent um, project. But yeah, that, that entire story of interoperability of data is incredibly important there. Um, we're also, for example, in talks now with uh, Surdorf in the Netherlands and our Guy Leuven IROTS team to figure out the IROTS connection to Dataverse uh, in a very generalist implementation way. And they're also <laughs> looking at this API call now, for example. So I think it, it's one of the many key elements that are important to a, a research commons, but it's so much more than the elements. It's about binding them all together and having an entire system that works well together. Uh, and it's more than just systems. It's also about human resources and education and that kind of stuff. So it's a tiny possible part of uh, what was presented yesterday. Oh, thank you. Are there any more su questions on this topic or another presentation? No? If no, well, thank you very much for the discussion and the presentation. <laughs> and do you want to make the reminders yes. for... Great, thank you everyone, that was very engaging. I tweeted all of you, so go and retweet, tag as many institutions as I could possibly easily find. Um, so we're a little early, but you know you have lunch. Excuse me? Oh my God, then why are we? Excuse me, don't go anywhere. I don't know why I thought we were. Somebody has my schedule, Dimitri. <laughs> Dimitri, I lent you my schedule, I need it back. I apologize, Rory. No problem. I lent it to Dimitri earlier, I said, give it back to me. Keeps me straight for the day. Thank you. I was like, wow, we're really, ending really early. No, all right. Okay, good, there it is. Okay. Where are we? Rory, where are we? 11.30 it should be. Yeah, it should be. No, I think they just, uh, the printout is not um, as up to date okay. as it should be. So, Rory is going to give us an update on our space going open, right? <laughs> open sourcing our space, an update from Rory, and everybody knows Rory and uh, his community. Um, and Tilo is not here, but we welcome him in spirit. So. Go for it, it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you to Sonia in particular, not just for this year, but uh, over the years for being so welcoming. And uh, I think there aren't too many uh, non-Dataversers who feel like they're a core member of the Dataverse community, and I'm fortunate to be one of those. So my first community meeting was in 2017, if I recall, and it was very successful, but I did have one regret which I discovered belatedly that in those days, the football or soccer match was held on the first day where the workshops took place, not on the last day as it is this time. And I didn't sign up for the workshops. I just came to the, the thing. And then afterwards I looked at it and, and I said, I have to wait 364 days for the next game. And uh, so I'm just, uh, I just like to, uh, to also put in a pitch, don't miss the football game tomorrow, okay? Um, Absolutely, absolutely. And especially because Mercedes not here this year, we need, we need more women representatives, so please, yeah. Uh, anyway, so uh, I don't think everybody probably does know our space. Some people do, some people don't. So um, anyway, here's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna briefly talk about our space for those who don't know about it. I'm gonna talk a little bit more detail about what we've done with Dataverse so far. Then I'm going to talk about the, the headline uh, uh, news for the presentation, which is 
our open source, how, where we are with open sourcing. Uh, and then I'm gonna close with some reflections and really an invitation to think about how we can collaborate uh, even more productively going forward. So uh, for those of you who missed it, we made an announcement, first public announcement on January 31st about going open source and that blog post is on our website. Um, again, for those who don't know what our space is, and I apologize for those who do, uh, our space started out life as an electronic lab notebook. I think probably most people know what that those are. It was a, it's a transitioning from paper lab notebooks, a digital environment for documenting your research. Uh, and over the years, we've made, we've made, we've made a lot of evolution. Uh, one of the most important things we did was to develop a, a, a really nice, modern inventory physical sample management system. And nowadays, whereas physical sample management systems used to be thought of as a separate product category, now, in order to be, call yourself an electronic lab notebook, you need to have a good sample management system, so we have that as well. Um, we also have a set of, uh, of open APIs. But I think as you can see from this diagram, over the years, really, our ecosystem has overtaken our product. So we're all about the ecosystem now, and we're all about interoperability. So let me briefly describe the ecosystem that we support, which is designed to facilitate the flows of data from the preparation to the active research to the archiving, storage, and, and reuse phases. So I'll talk about the, the purple ones in a minute, but let's talk about the, uh, the blue ones. So you could think of it as we have support for what I think of as research flows, and we also have support for what I think of as research data management flows. The, the purple ones are research data management, the blue ones are, are research. So one of the first things, it, this is coming up, you know, themes that have been discussed here. One of the first things we did was recognize the, that uh, in order, uh, it, it, people would want to associate data which they weren't bringing into our space with the experimental write-up in our space. So we made it possible to make links to external file stores. Uh, that's over on the left there. And uh, that's a critical part of, of our space. It's the ability to, to make links and bring in data from other resources that people use. In addition to um, doing that with, um, with uh, traditional SMPT and SMB file stores, things like that, we also have integrations with all the, all the um, commercial file sharing apps, as well as things like, which are popular in Europe, like Nextcloud and OwnCloud. And then we also have integrations with specific applications which are specific to particular workflows of users of our space, like an animal colony management system, Pyrat, like an equipment scheduling system, cluster market, and soon with FAMES, which is a field data collection tool, um, which is very relevant to being here in CIMIT. Uh, and uh, so then the point is you can associate these specific types of data also with the experimental write-up in our space. Uh, as well as with Omiro is another important one, the uh, open microscopy environment for, um, for images. Um, we also have an integration with, uh, with Elementa, which is a, which is a voice, voice in the lab application as well. Uh, and then more recently, we've, we've, well, relatively recently, we've done, we're doing a lot with iRODs, a huge amount with iRODs. The initial integration with iRODs enhances the, the linking so that if you link to an external file, uh, as file in an external store, and iRODs can crawl those files, it, breaks, it fixes the broken links problem. So if the file moves location, the integrity of the link is maintained. So then, then how about the, the research data management uh, support? So we now have integrations with three of the DMP tools, with Argos, DMP Tool, and DMP Online. Uh, and we also have integrations with four repositories of which Dataverse is, uh, we have, we, we're agnostic in a sense, but we're also not agnostic. So, I mean, Dataverse is our special friend, um, but we also have integrations with others because we have to support what other people want to use. So I think the, the flow that we support with data management plans is quite um, instructive of the, of, of the benefits you can get from tool integration. So you can, you can import a data management plan into our space then you can make links, you can associate the data management plan with the data that you actually produce in your research. And then you can export, when you export the data to Dataverse, um, 
the uh, Dataverse then assigns a DOI back to the, uh, the, the data management plan. So, you know, it's a, it, it's a nice little workflow and it makes, things, it makes things very easy. Also, the exports to Dataverse and other repositories are quite powerful. You can export the data from our space, but you have the option of also exporting data, um, uh, the, 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 the data to you link to as well, so you can bundle it back up and put it all together in Dataverse, so the integrity, the totality of the work that you've done uh, is, is maintained in, uh, in Dataverse. Um, yeah, so, so that's kind of an overview of our space uh, generally. I mentioned that we now have a, a really, it really rocks, an amazing physical sample management system. It's mobile first, it's, vi it's visual, it's, it's very, uh, uh, oh sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So I'll come on to that in a minute. So the, the kind of, our vision is that we're always working we know our people, researchers and research data managers that work with our space are working inside the, the famous research data life cycle, um, which this is one version of it. This is the University College London. One of our customers is their version. So planning, collection, storage, analysis, deposit, um, et cetera. Uh, and you can see here, I'm not proposing to go into details, but you can see the various, if you go back to the previous slide, the various, um, uh, integrations that we have enable us to integrate with tools which are which organizations are already using in the data life cycle uh, at, at, at their institution. Our, our counterparts are primarily institutions at the moment, although I think that is with the advent of research commons going to change. Um, and so the kind of our mission, if you will, is to facilitate passage of data and metadata through the research life cycle, working with tool interoperability. Yeah. So here's what I was about started to say. Uh, many people think of our space as just being an electronic cloud notebook, but that's not accurate, as I said. So sample management isn't really new, uh, but I just put it here, and I just make the point that we have a, a fully featured um, uh, system for managing physical samples. And it's also deeply integrated with the ELN, so you can associate the sample data that's produced with the experimental data uh, and then include that in, in, uh, in also, again, in things that you export to, um, to Dataverse. Um, so we've been doing, the last year we've been kind of obsessed with metadata, I would say. Uh, one of the really exciting things we did was um, worked on the new international generic sample number, which was mentioned yesterday, and, and my colleague Vida is going to be talking a bit more about that tomorrow, uh, but it's a new, uh, is being delivered by, by DataCite as a DOI for, for physical samples. And I think it's already the, uh, less than a, about a year in, it's already the, the second, accounts for the second largest number of DOIs. So it's going to be really, really important. Uh, and we've incorporated into the sample management system I was describing so that you can associate an IGSN with, uh, with the sample data in our space. And then you can uh, create a landing page uh, which is resolvable with the information, the, 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 the mandatory metadata required for, by IGSNs and also additional fields that you think are relevant to your particular, uh, particular sample. You can also associate a ROAR uh, with the IGSNs. Uh, another thing we're working on, which is going, I think going to be extremely important, is PIDs for instruments, uh, which, is, which are just coming into production. So we're going to, we think the IGSN integration we've done is quite, relevant in many ways for the incorporating PIDs. So we'll be incorporating, incorporating support for PIDs for instruments. And I, I actually made, made this comment yesterday, but I think IGSNs and PIDs for instruments are going to be game changing because researchers want them. It's not, you don't have to persuade researchers to use them. They're the ones that are, have been pushing for this. It's really a bottom up type of thing. So I think that's going to be interesting to watch. And we're also planning to incorporate um, the RAID, which is the new project based uh, or research activity-based uh, identifier. Um, so far we've been working on, uh, it's all in the sample management system, but we're also going to be incorporating support for DOIs on the, in the electronic lab notebook side um, of our space. So in terms of the existing um, our space Dataverse integration, this slide tries to summarize that. As I mentioned, you can export data directly from our space into uh, Dataverse. And I actually, the, the DMP tool, when I mentioned, you can uh, also fit your DMP 
uh, into, that, into that workflow. I already described that. We've also done some work with controlled vocabulary so that you can uh, associate, uh, we've just, we're just starting on this, but there's a, one of the, uh, the bio portal, which is a, a controlled vocabulary uh, library for, uh, for biology. You can associate an ontology from BioPortal with a data set in RSpace, and then when you make the export to, to Dataverse, you have the option of also including the associated um, controlled vocabulary, and there's a field in Dataverse, so that, that um, controlled vocabulary relationship with the data is maintained after it passes into, into Dataverse. Um, we also have the automatic uh, population of the ORCID ID, uh, and we're, this is one of the things we're, we're in discussions with at the moment, and we hope to soon enable um, also the uh, IGSNs to likewise uh, pass to uh, Dataverse, uh, the, the link to the IGSN which has been created when the, uh, in our space to pass to Dataverse again as part, of the, as part of the export. So you can see we've actually done over the years and quite a lot, uh, and, um, and that's what some examples of the kind of things we've done uh, so now we, let me turn to the next topic, which is talk a little bit about our open source journey. Uh, so Phil, there he is, will remember uh, back in 2017, the first thing we ever, ever open sourced was the, uh, was the repository code, which we did with the, the Dataverse integration. Um, and so that was, that was, we did that, that was great. But it wasn't really until a couple of years ago when we started to notice that in, in Europe in particular, um, there were other electronic lab, open source electronic lab notebooks were becoming, becoming, becoming into existence and then starting to gain some traction. And then we also noticed that um, many of our existing customers and potential customers we were talking with were saying, oh, you know, you should think about going open source. And then it began to be more like, you really should go open source. So uh, we're not completely deaf, so we, we listened to this uh, this feedback, and we also saw it was interesting how some of the open source CLNs were were actually getting getting interesting development because they had gone open source. Uh, and then this wasn't directly related, but in 2021 and 22, we began developing integrations with with other open source offerings, uh, like I think things like iRods and Omiro and Nextcloud. And so we began to see, oh, there's other models out there. There's other ways of doing things. And then finally, all this kind of came, came together, and I actually mentioned this in, in Braga nine months ago. Uh, I think maybe that was my first public announcement that we were going to do it. It was very, very um, tentative at that stage. We, anyway, we concluded that open source is the way to go, and we, and we decided to do a detailed exploration of how the transition could work. And really, the key moment was we needed a person to, to drive the project. And so the key moment for us was when we were extremely fortunate in October of last year, when Tilo Mathis joined Research Spaces as open source lead, and Tilo has been has been driving things much faster and and more more effectively than I could have I could have hoped in my my wildest dreams. So you know, why are we going open source? I don't think it's uh, you know it's kind of need to mention it to this community, but uh, we got collaboration with the community. We get we'll have enhanced interoperability with tools and services, which is what we're all about further enhancement of fair data workflows and support for, for open science. Uh, it's actually been a, quite, a, quite a challenging thing, uh, as you maybe can imagine, you know, what's, what's the right, right open source model? We need to think about our needs as, a, as an organization, the community needs. It requires a lot of review of our, the way we do things internally. Um, the, the software inventory was is reviewing that has been a, a huge project because our space is now quite quite a large code base at this moment. And they also had to think about what are the implications for our commercial services, because we don't have a sugar daddy. We have to continue to make money. And if we don't do that, you know, it's all going to fall apart. So so all of these things were, were there. Um, so what are the challenges we faced? Well, there aren't that many. There aren't that many. I always think that Build, reference, you know, benchmarking is critical, it's the way to go, but th there aren't that many closed to open source transitions, so it wasn't really easy for us to, it was easy for us to point to Dataverse and iRods and Nextcloud as being open source, but people making that transition, that, that weren't really, really models for us. Uh, we use some commercial components in our, in our own software, so we had to figure out how to separate those out. 
Um, our space is developed over many years, and it's a large software project, so there, it's, 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 a lot to, it's a lot to handle to think about. Um, so the model that we have come up with um, is a, a GPL 3.0 license. Uh, research space is going to remain the maintainer of the project, which will both provide opportunity for community contributions. Uh, we, again, this, I, this I, I've been observing over the years, in particular over the last year, how this issue of how to deal with third party contributions that comes up a lot here. So we're definitely hoping to, to learn from you. Um, and we also don't want to bite off more than we can chew. So we're going to kind of proceed cautiously um, and try to build an open source community step by step. And our initial focus is on enabling code contributions. And then, as I said, research base as an organization will continue to provide or will provide enterprise grade services around our space. So that's our model. Um, so the enterprise services, which are pretty become pretty clear because we need to do this, we need to be ready quite soon. Um, so we're going to offer deployment and managed hosting, uh, customization, migration, um, and, 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 and some commercial third party integrations, which we can only offer um, uh, through this uh, training and onboarding for both for IT research data managers and researchers and continuous support and consultation. So it's actually pretty much what we're already doing only we're trying to gussy it up and making it look a bit prettier and maybe describe it better because we actually, I think we do a pretty good job of all this already, but maybe as compared to some of our competitors, we don't, we don't really describe it. We don't do ourselves justice in the description. So we're going to try to make this more of a, uh, of, a, of, a, of a package. Uh, um, so the last part of the talk, which is the most important, is how can we continue to work together and continue to do even more things together? So Dataverse, as I've already said, uh, it's been an inspiration and a reference for us over the years as a product. Uh, and it's also an inspiration and a reference for us as a, as a community. So you're our, you're our guiding star. Uh, and we're hoping that going open source will stimulate even more and deeper collaboration opportunities between our space and Dataverse. I'd like to especially thank Phil for the many conversations he and I have had over the years, but also for the support you've been giving uh, Tilo uh, in recent months as well. Um, so what are some of the collaboration opportunities that have occurred to us? Um, just list a few. So an obvious one is, to, is enhancing the, the actual integration which already exists. Uh, so f some examples, specific examples we, is, is common use of PIDs in controlled vocabularies, for example, around sample management data and IGSNs. There's, there's things we can do to do there because we're both working on them, but to make the flow um, uh, more streamlined. Um, again, all these topics have already come up in the, in the last couple of days is making sure that we're aligned around metadata standards, metadata uh, um, standardization. Something else which we haven't really discussed today, but which we're actually quite interested in. I don't think that there's been that much discussion this time so far about data curation, unless I missed it, but too packed, okay. But this whole data curation is a really interesting thing. I mean, you wanna be doing data curation long before you think about your deposit. So we're actually gonna be developing a data curation role and data curation workflows inside our space, which, which will facilitate a more effective deposit into Dataverse and other repositories. That's certainly something we want to think about and, and, and talk to. So there's the kind of development side of it. Uh, then we have a number of existing um, mutual deployments and they, they as, as our space and Dataverse get more deployments, it seems like there's more and more all the time. So there's certainly, I mean, UIT is a, is a shining example uh, of maybe the first one but there's certainly opportunity to do more around, to work with our existing institutional uh, you know, uh, partners together. Um, and then joint participation in, in research commons, if they're called research commons or not, uh, is I think really an exciting opportunity uh, because if you look at, to me, our space and Dataverse together are arguably, they're the core of what should be in, in many, if not most research commons. So we've already done, a reason, uh, so that's a start, and it, it, maybe it's a, it's a model as well. That's something we could think about. And then something else which is very much on my mind uh, is I've looked with uh, incredible jealousy over the years at the uh, huge grants which other software 
uh, research data management software projects get, and we haven't gotten any. We're now starting to get a few, and I'm starting to understand. So I now see that grants is actually really important. And so um, I think there's, I already have a couple of ideas for possible joint, joint grants, which we might think about. Not actual, well, actual, grant, actual grants, actual calls, as well as kind of things we might work on in grants. So that could be, could be another thing. Um, and then there, the other thing, apart from the, the Dataverse specific things, uh, is going open source is going to, of course, open us to community collaboration opportunities generally. Um, so we'll be able to exchange learnings around, with Dataverse around community building, maintaining and growing. Uh, again, we're just taking baby steps and this is a very mature and incredibly dynamic and exciting community. Uh, but again, we would be interested in, in joint meetups um, as well. Um, and then looking at, it's not just our space and Dataverse and maybe joint initiatives to strengthen the global RDM developer community beyond our space and Dataverse because there are these other groups out there which are really important and are doing important things like Omiro and IRODs are, are two that, uh, that spring to mind and we all, we already have relationships with all of them. So we might think about how we could um, uh, work together more. So what's next? So in Q2, uh, we will actually be making the transition. It's not very far off. Uh, then we hope to have our first community meeting in Q3. And then in Q4, take a, a little retrospective and see how things are going and plan out the strategy for 2025. Uh, and then actually in, uh, release a roadmap for 2025 and look at, um, and look at ways in which we can actually focus on, on product development with the community. Um, so um, please, you're invited to, to contribute. We, we'd love it if you'd pitch ideas, share feedback, share experiences, contribute code, and support our, our very uh, nascent uh, community. Um, so a few things that, um, that, that you could do before the launch, you could sign up to our open source community mailing list if you'd like to be kept apprised of what's happening. Um, we, you can follow the RSpace organization page on GitHub, which is going to be the home of our, our project. Uh, you can follow our blog, and actually, a new blog just came out this morning uh, to, to uh, coincide with my talk today. And, um, and so that, that's an update on what we're doing as well. Uh, and then you can reach out to open source uh, at researchbase.com. Uh, and here's the new blog that just came out this morning. And so just as I say, we'd like to, we'd like to learn from you. We, we, we need to learn from you. What can we learn from the, the Dataverse open source community? How can we make our project useful for, for Dataverse? Uh, and how would you like to be involved? Thank you. Great, thanks. So I don't know if there's any questions or comments. If not, time for lunch, okay, thanks.